Hello and welcome to California Ballot Initiative Forum. We'll get Hello, and welcome to the California Ballot Initiative Forum, hosted by the League of Women Voters of San Francisco and our coalition of higher ed and women's-based organizations, including UCSF, the Science Policy Group at UCSF, the University of San Francisco, San Francisco State University, and the Women's March of San Francisco. I am Allie Jones with UCSF Community and Government Relations, and I'm very excited for today's program where we will learn the ins and outs the arguments for and against each of the statewide ballot measures. The upcoming election is unique in many ways, but one thing remains constant. Voting is how we make our voices heard. With so much uncertainty in our daily lives, voting is a very tangible way that we can make an impact. You can help promote a healthy democracy by asking your family, friends, and colleagues how they plan to vote safely this election. Ballots have been mailed to all registered California voters. If you have not received your ballot, please check that your voter registration is accurate by this Tuesday, October 19th, is the voter registration deadline. Remember, you can vote early and return your ballot by mail or at your county's official drop-off location. This event will be recorded and shared with everyone who registered, so you can truly use this as your supplemental ballot guide. A reminder that this event today is nonpartisan. The League of Women Voters will not be making any recommendations today about how to vote, but will provide you with the tools to make a more informed vote. The League will be addressing your questions, so please submit them in the Q&A box, and they are holding some time at the end to answer a few of them live. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, Vice President of Voter Services, Danielle Diebler, and Board Member Maxine Anderson. Hello, I'm Danielle Dibler. I'm the VP of Voter Services for the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, and I am getting ready to share a little walk along slide deck with you. Just give me one second to get my, to figure out which screen I'm actually sharing with you. <laughs> All right. Okay, and while you're doing that, Danielle, I'm Maxine. Nice screen. Um, <laughs> I'm Maxine Anderson. I'm also with the League of Women Voters right now serving on the League of Women Voters of California board. Thanks yeah, to so, all of you. Yeah, so Maxine has all the skinny on the state ballot propositions because she actually does, her, her league actually does all the pro-con stuff for the actual state ballot props. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about the league today. Um, we're going to cover regional ballot measure RR. Um, so the regional ballot measure we're covering because it covers three different counties. Um, we also covered it in the presentation that we did in San, on San Francisco uh, on Wednesday. And then we're going to go through the state ballot propositions. So a little bit about the league. Um, we are a nonpartisan political nonprofit. Um, our, our charter is really to defend democracy, provide education, and encourage people to vote in elections and participate in their government. Um, and we also do do some advocacy uh, work where we influence public policy. Uh, that typically is done over a, a long period of time, sometimes as long as a decade, where we will look at things that are public policy that we feel benefits the community and we will make recommendations. Um, we don't support or oppose candidates or political parties. Um, so sometimes we do make policy recommendations, but we never support or oppose candidates or political parties. Um, and the other thing to note about the League is that even though that we are called the League of Women Voters, um, we accept people of all genders. Uh, and, and welcome them into our membership and to our volunteer organization. Uh, we are a completely volunteer run organization. Um, and if you're looking for additional information about how to vote, what to, how to fill out your ballots, uh, how to vote in special circumstances, uh, and you're in San Francisco, you can go to lwvsf.org slash vote. And that's kind of our one-stop shop for all of our guides and videos and as much information as we have on all the different ballot measures. And with that, I am going to pop right into our first measure. Uh, so measure RR uh, is the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board Caltrain, and it's a sales tax measure. Uh, 
So the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board is a combination of Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, and the city and county of San Francisco. Um, it was put on the ballot because there are some rider shortfalls due to COVID-14 or COVID-19 <laughs> um, for the Caltrain line. Um, and the question before the voters is, shall the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board propose to levy a 30-year, one-eighth cent sales tax to preserve Caltrain service, providing approximately $100 million annually for Caltrain? Should that be adopted? And if you vote yes, you, you're saying, yes, I want this to be adopted. I want the sales tax and I want it to go to fund Caltrain. And if you say no, you're saying, no, I want to maintain the status quo and I don't want to pass this particular initiative. On the supporter side, you have measure RR funding. It'll help keep Caltrain from shutting down. Um, there's, uh, there's a huge de decrease in ridership for all public transit right now, including Caltrain, um, but there are still a number of essential workers who use this type of service to get to work on a daily basis, and that's nurses, doctors, physician's assistants, people who work in food service. Um, those people are still using this type of public transit. Uh, this would also fund system improvements, so faster and more frequent trains. Uh, it would electrify the line. Uh, which would help us with cleaner, quieter trains. It would do, reduce noise and air pollution. Um, if we provide more interconnections with BART and SAMTRAN, that would actually provide better transit service overall, and it would prevent traffic congestion and remove cars from the highways. Um, also, Measure RR does have a required financial accountability aspect, uh, including oversights and yearly audits. So, Opponents to this measure say Caltrain ridership is not going to recover. Uh, this COVID-19 loss of ridership that we've seen, um, people who have higher incomes, they're probably going to continue to work remotely. Um, and people are concerned about the risk of using public transportation um, based on this pandemic. And then low and middle income earners and people who are unemployed, they can't afford another regressive sales tax. And a big one here is the length of time on the opponent side that this tax actually lasts. Um, there are a few other arguments. Caltrain has wasteful and excessive spending. They spend a lot on high pension costs, excessive, especially executive salaries. Um, and the existing transportation sales tax that we have uh, can fund Caltrain at its current level. The one thing to note about Caltrain is it's one of the very few organizations, uh, or I'm sorry, it's the only um, public transit organization that's funded in the way that it is, um, where it has some voluntary contribution from the different counties that participate in it. Um, most public transit is funded kind of in a more, uh, a more co consistent way from a year-to-year -year perspective. Um, so, and then this requires a two-thirds majority to pass from all counties. So it has to have two-thirds in all of the counties that the Joint Power Board is present in. And now we're going to get into uh, state ballot propositions. So the first one is Prop 14. This is on stem cell research. I'm guessing this is probably of particular interest to the audience that we have here since there is a big contingent, I think, from UCSF. Um, so the question before voters is, should California sell $5.5 billion in new bonds to continue funding grants for research and development of stem cell treatments? Very simply, if you vote for this, it means that you think that we should sell these new bonds. If you vote against it, you think it, we should not sell these new bonds. Um, a little bit of background. In 2004, we approved Proposition 71. It added this provision to the California Constitution that actually allowed stem cell research. And then we also created the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, CRM. Uh, and this allowed the state to sell $3 billion in bonds to fund the CRM grants and then the operation of that actual organization itself. Um, we would then, we've, we've depleted the funds that were allocated in that uh, 2004 proposition, and now they're asking for an additional 5.5 billion in new bonds so that they can continue funding stem cell and other medical research and training um, and deliver these treatments to patients and construct new research facilities and actually administer the organization itself. So on the supporter side, you have uh, people saying the stem cell funding has led to significant advances, uh, cures for diseases uh, and treatments, uh, and over 2,900 new medical discoveries. Uh, 70 patient advocacy groups 
support this initiative uh, and feel like it would increase patient access and affordable treatments. And it would provide patients and their families with financial assistance for some of these treatments that maybe insurance might not cover. Um, Prop 14, it also contributes to a rebounding of the California economy. So the funding to date has generated $10.7 billion in economic stimulus, um, and that's been fed back into the economy. And so the feeling is that this new investment would, would actually have similar types of returns. On the opponent side, it's this bond will cost $7.3 billion. Um, by the time we've actually paid it off, and we can't afford this at in the middle of the economic crisis that we have right now. It could increase taxes. Um, the previous funding hasn't yielded the results uh, that we would we, we wanted, uh, and private investors and companies, they've made a lot of strides in the stem cell research and cure areas, uh, and we should continue to let the private sector lead this. Um, and then independent analysis and outlets, they've questioned some of the management and integrity and transparency of the agency. Um, so we shouldn't put more funding essentially into this agency. Prop 15, this is taxes on commercial property. Uh, so the question is, should the California Constitution be amended so that most commercial and industrial property is assessed on a regular basis? So this is one of two initiatives that are on the, uh, the California uh, ballot slate this year and that are around uh, changes to Prop 13. Um, in this particular case, um, it would, Currently, so if a property is assessed when it's purchased or ownership changed, after that assessed value, um, they can increase by more than 2% per year um, in terms of their, their, tax, their tax bill. So most, in the proper, most of the property in the state is now assessed at less than what its kind of current market value is. So this is particularly true of commercial and industrial properties, and that's because they tend to change ownership a lot less often than residential properties do. So Prop 15 would require that commercial properties be assessed on a regular basis. There's no changes to the assessment rules for residential properties or farms. Um, and the phased reassessment would start in 2022. Could be delayed a little bit longer if the legislature, ch legislature chooses for that to happen, but it can, it can start as early as 2022. There are two exemptions to this for commercial businesses, small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. They don't pay that tax. And then commercial properties worth $3 million or less would also be exempt. Um, on the fiscal side, the legislative analysis uh, for the California Comptroller estimates that Prop 15 could produce up to 6.5 to $11.5 billion per year, uh, and approximately 60% of that would go to local government and 40% would go to schools. So on the pr proponent side, so people who support it say Prop 15 would provide billions in new revenue for communities and schools. Uh, it would really focus in on the 10% of the wealthiest businesses providing 90% of the revenue. Um, it would give actually some additional tax breaks to small businesses and that would help to make the economy more robust. And it also keeps the protections for Prop 13, from Prop 13 for homeowners, renters, and farms. Prop 15, on the opponent side would trigger the largest tax increase in California history. So these additional costs would ultimately raise prices for consumers. So if someone has owned a property for a really long time, they suddenly get a huge tax bill, they're gonna pass that on to the consumers. Um, it'll make it harder for people to start small businesses and it will require a huge administrative cost. Um, there's not a ton on what the administrative cost and overhead would be, um, but it is noted in the text of the bill that there would be administrative of cost for essentially assessing these properties um, and doing the reassessment and then issuing essentially the tax bill to the new to the to the new tax bill. Um, Prop 16 um, is the allowance for public agencies to consider diversity in um, hiring for public employment, education, and contractors. Um, so kind of the, a little bit of background on this. Before 1996, California um, and local entities, they had policies intended to increase opportunities and representation for people who faced inequality. Um, and these were called affirmative action programs. You might be familiar with them. Um, in 1996, we approved Prop 209, um, and that generally banned the consideration of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public policy, public employment, or public contracting. Um, so if this is approved, Prop 16 would repeal the, the section of the California Constitution that introduced Prop 209. So it would eliminate this ban. It would allow these agencies to take things like sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in these particular areas, they could take that into account um, in their policies and procedures as long as it 
complies with federal and state law that's, that's around equal protection. So on the supporter side, a yes basically means you know, if you support this, it means equality for all Californians. Um, it, despite living in one of the most diverse states in the nation, women and people of color are still discriminated against. And also because of the timing, we're at a historic moment right now uh, in terms of how uh, these types of issues are being perceived. We need California to be at the forefront and we need to strengthen California by overturning discrimination in, in all the areas that we possibly can. On the opponent side, um, you get people who are feel like this is really a step backwards, right? It's introducing a new form of discrimination. Um, and it's also perpetuating the stereotype that minorities and women can't make it unless they get special preferences. Um, it also will be costly to enforce uh, and that burden could be uh, really pushed back onto the taxpayers. So there's a there's a concern that administering this type of a program and auditing it um, would would actually require a lot of money. So Prop 17 is uh, voting rights for people on parole. Uh, so the question is, should people on parole in California be allowed to register to vote and vote in elections? So the current kind of state of the art is the California Constitution prohibits people in prison or on parole from voting. This proposition would allow people on parole to vote. Uh, people on probation are already allowed to vote or if they're in county jail. Um, so this really, restores the voting rights to people who have previously been disqualified because they've been serving in prison. So when they complete their prison term, if they're released and put on parole and, you know, they, at that point in time, they're usually, they have a job, they're trying to find a place to live, they're participating in the community, it would then make them eligible to also vote. Um, the, and they would be able to participate in elections. A byproduct of that is they could also potentially run for elective office if they were qualified in all the other areas that they would need to be for elective office. So on the supporter side, um, people feel like when people complete their prison sentences, they should be encouraged as much as possible to re-enter society. Uh, and that means having a stake in their community and that means being able to vote. Um, there are 19 other states right now where this is allowed, so California should catch up. Um, and it would, it would essentially enfranchise 50,000 Californians who've completed their prison terms. They pay taxes at a local and a federal level, but they're prohibited at voting at any level of government. On the opponent side, Prop 17 would allow violent criminals to vote before completing their sentence, right? So the viewpoint here is that your parole is considered part of your sentence and that in order to complete it, you have to complete not only the time that you were in prison, but also the time that you're on parole. Um, parole in California is for serious and violent criminals who have victimized innocence. This essentially puts aside that victim pain and suffering and gives them equity before they're, they've really gone through their full rehabilitation program. Um, and then parole is, a, this is very similar to the one before it. It's, a, it's supposed to prove rehabil rehabilitation before liberty. So they should have to wait until they finish that parole sentence before they actually have full liberty restored, including voting. Prop 18, this one is pretty straightforward. Um, this is voting rights for 17 year olds. So should 17 year olds who will be 18 by the general election be allowed to vote in the primary and special election in that election cycle? So essentially today, if you are, if you're 17, you can pre-register to vote. Um, if you are going to be 18 by the next election, the general election, you would be able to vote, but you can't vote in the primary. Um, so this would allow for 17 year olds who are going to be 18 during the general election to have some say in the primary in terms of who the candidates are going to be um, that are going to appear in their general election ballot. So it gives them a, a more, a, a fuller participation in the process. Um, it also as a byproduct, um, because if you can register to vote, you can run for elective office. A 17 year old could run for elective office if they meet all of the other existing eligibility requirements for that office. So you're gonna, there's a very similar one on the ballot for San Francisco, if you happen to be a San Francisco resident, uh, and the arguments are very similar. The one in San Francisco is giving uh, youth who are 16 the right to vote. Um, this one is around 17 year olds that are 17 in the primary election. So the arguments for, they can participate in the full election cycle. It'll boost the number of youth who actually turn out. Um, these policies do affect 17 and 18 year olds, so they should be able to vote on them. 
Um, and I, I would say the, the big, the two kind of, the two last ones kind of go together. Um, it's the idea that this full participation, it will not only make them more engaged in that actual, that race, but it will also build a lifelong voting habit, one that really is essential for getting this segment to, to participate fully in our democracy. And then on the opponent side, um, the idea that 17 year olds might not pay taxes. Um, so they may be biased by people who influence them like their parents or teachers um, versus having real firsthand knowledge of these particular issues. They're too young to vote. They need more life experience before they're ready. Uh, their brains are not fully developed. So they're not gonna make logical and reasonable decisions. Um, and they may be again, persuaded by someone who is influential in their life to vote in a certain way versus becoming an informed voter. Um, and then only 18 other states allow 17 year olds to vote was the, is the last argument against it. Prop 19 is a change in property tax rules. This is the other initiative that impacts Prop 13 uh, or changes some of the rules around Prop 13. Um, so this is a change in property tax rules. So the question is, should the California Constitution be changed to modify the rules for transferring property tax assessed values and use any resulting new tax revenues for fire suppression efforts, schools, and local governments? So Prop 13, just a little bit of background on this one, because um, I think Prop 13 kind of impacts everybody almost in every election. Um, it set an initial tax assessment on property values in 1975, and annual uh, assessments were and increases were limited to 2%. So this, it, it does set some exceptions. So currently some homeowners over 55, if you have a severe disability, um, if you've been impacted by a natural disaster, you're allowed a once in a lifetime transfer of the taxable value to a different home of equal or lesser value within two years. Uh, so if you say downsize from a larger home to a smaller home, when you retire, um, you become disabled and you do the same thing, you're, you're impacted by essentially a wildfire and you move someplace else. If that house is of equal or lesser value and you move there within two years, you kind of you keep that one time lifetime transfer. Um, and then there's also when principal residences are inherited by adult children or grandchildren, the heirs inherit the original owner's lower assessment of taxes. So what Prop 19 would do is it would allow eligible homeowners to transfer that taxable um, component to a more expensive home anywhere in the state up to three times. Um, it would also eliminate the transfer tax values on inherited properties unless it's the principal residence or a farm. So you, you would no longer benefit from that, but it would if it, unless it was your primary residence or it was classified as a farm. It would also use this increased tax revenue from Prop 19 for statewide fire suppression efforts and to reimburse the county costs around those same types of incidents. It would probably yield local government and schools tens of millions of dollars a year. Um, but transferring those lower tax bills to a different home, it could reduce the revenue in some counties depending on how people move around. And then the administrative costs are expected to be in the tens of millions of dollars per year. So supporters say that it expands uh, Prop 13 for homeowners who are seniors, wildfire victims, or people with disabilities. It allows this transfer of their home and it opens them up to being able to replace that home anywhere in California. And it closes tax loopholes on inherited properties so that are not gonna be used as primary residents. And that revenue then gets directed to fire protection schools and local government. Opponents uh, say the California constitution has been amended three times to protect the rights of families to pass on their homes um, and without changing Prop 13 tax assessment. So we don't really need this. Um, and then the reassessment to market value, it could force people to sell properties that have been in their families for a long time because they can't afford the new property taxes. So if you were assessed in 1975 at $300,000, now your property is worth $3 million. That bill essentially and that change um, from a tax bill perspective is something that some families are not going to be able to support. And then I am going to hand off for the remaining uh, Prop 20 through 25 to uh, Maxine and she is going to share those. I will keep my slides up, but I will mute. I'll get rid of my video. Ah. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, I'm, again, starting with Proposition 20. Thanks to all of you for being in on this uh, call on the Zoom. And Proposition 20 makes changes to the criminal, to criminal penalties and parole here in California. 
The question before um, voters is, should California law be amended to make changes to the process by which people are charged with certain crimes and the process for granting them parole? Um, over the past 10 years, California has passed several um, measures intended to reduce the prison population here in California. It has shifted people convicted of some nonviolent felonies from state to local county jails, and it has redefined certain nonviolent, non-serious felonies as misdemeanors unless the defendant had previous convictions. And it has allowed the sen resentencing for people convicted of these redefined offenses. It increased opportunities for parole for those who have completed their sentence for nonviolent felonies. Um, and um, despite the changes that were made, um, the prisons are still at this point operating at capacity above that ordered by the U.S. Supreme Court. Prop 20 would change various provisions passed earlier. It would redefine certain theft and fraud offenses that were earlier categorized as misdemeanors and, would, and those would become so-called wobblers, meaning they could be charged as either misdemeanors or felonies. It would require the collection of DNA from people convicted for some crimes, and it would create a list of criteria for the Board of Parole hearings, allowing prosecutors to review information about the inmate and it would allow victims' families to participate in the parole review. Prop 20 would expand the list of crimes classified as violent, and it would make changes to the information provided to local officials when an inmate is released to, par to parole or probation. Supporters of this particular proposition say, Prop 20 reclassifies certain crimes like assault with a deadly weapon, date rape, and child abuse as violent crimes. It would not increase the prison population. It would only ensure that people convicted of these crimes serve their full sentences. And it would help stop car break-ins, shoplifting, and other thefts that have been on the rise. Opponents say Prop 20 will roll back prison reforms and cost taxpayers millions of dollars annually. It would expand the category of felonies ineligible for early parole, thereby keeping more inmates in prison. It would slash mental health and rehabilitation programs that help to prepare people for release from prison and reduce repeat offenses. And Prop 20 would result in extreme sentences for petty theft and would disproportionately impact vulnerable minorities. Proposition 21, local governments and rent control. The question before you is should current state law be changed to allow cities and counties to apply rent control to housing 15 years or older and limit rent increases to 15% once a new renter moves in? Currently a state law known as the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act abbreviated to cost of Hawkins, limits local rent control laws. What we found is that California renters, the background on this is California renters typically pay 50% more for housing than renters in other states because demand greatly exceeds supply. About one-fifth of the Californians, about one-fifth of Californians are subject to these rent, rent control laws which uh, limit how much their rent can increase annually. Courts, of rule, courts have ruled that such laws must allow landlords to receive a fair rate of return. Currently, state law limits local rent control laws. At currently, they can, rent control laws cannot apply to any single family home. They can never apply to newly built housing completed since early 1995, and they cannot say how much rent can be charged to a new renter. This proposal, Prop 21, would reduce the limits on current local rent control laws so that cities and counties can apply more rent controls, including controls on older housing, with some exceptions. Cities and counties could limit how much a landlord could increase the rent when a new renter moves in, and it would require that rent control laws allow a fair rate of return 
for landlords. Supporters say even small increases in rent force more families into homelessness, which burdens the entire community. Many seniors and veterans presently are left with too few resources for food, medical care, and other needs. Supporters also say Prop 21 guarantees landlords a reasonable profit. Opponents to Prop 21 say, studies show that rent control reduces the availability of rental housing and that some local governments exacerbate the shortage of rental housing through their zoning restrictions. And finally, that Prop 21 would stop new housing from being built, cost jobs, and hurt the economic economy. The next proposition, Proposition 22, ride share and delivery drivers. Um, just as a note that this may be the most costly ballot proposition California has ever had, um, with more than $200 million being spent on this particular issue. The question before you is should app-based rideshare and delivery drivers be classified as independent contractors and not employees and require rideshare and delivery companies to adopt labor and wage policies unique to these drivers? Right now, rideshare and delivery companies such as Uber and Lyft um, hire persons as independent contractors of which there are about 900,000 of them in the ride share and delivery, um, acting as ride share and delivery drivers in California. Um, they choose when and where to work, providing their own vehicles, these drivers do, and most work part-time, making between 11 and $16 per hour. These drivers, as indicated, are independent contractors and are not entitled to legal protections and benefits required for employees such as minimum wage, overtime, unemployment insurance, and workers' comp. So our California legislature passed AB5, Assembly Bill 5, which reclassified drivers as employees rather than independent contractors. Prop 22 would again reclassify these drivers as independent contractors, unless Unless a company sets a driver's hours, requires drivers to accept certain rides or deliveries, or restricts them from working for other companies, and they would not receive benefits instead, or the benefits that an employee would. Instead, Prop 22 would require companies to provide minimum compensation of at least 120% of minimum wage for each hour spent driving, a health insurance stipend, coverage for medical expenses when a driver is injured while driving, restrict driving to um, no more than 12 hours a day, and conduct uh, background checks and mandate safety training. This ballot proposition would also prevent local jurisdictions from setting their own rules for ride share and delivery companies, such as setting a higher minimum compensation. Supporters say AB5 would lead to longer wait times, higher prices for riders, and less access to rideshare and delivery services. Prop 22 would improve delivery and rideshare work by requiring companies to provide new benefits and expand public safety protections. Opponents say Prop 22 would eliminate basic workplace protection and replace them with lower guaranteed earnings and healthcare subsidies to save costs for the companies. And current law does not limit driver flexibility. A majority of drivers work 30 or more hours per week. Proposition 23, kidney dialysis clinics. The question before you is should outpatient dialysis clinics be required to have a physician on site at all hours when patients are being treated and offered the same level of care to all patients regardless of insurance and report in infection-related information. Right now, there are approximately 600 clinics um, 
in California that are licensed by the California Department of Health using federal certification standards. Um, most of the dialysis is paid for by Medicare and Medi-Cal, although private insurance companies also pay into kidney dialysis clinics at rates that are multiple times higher than those paid by government programs. Uh, also, currently, there are about two companies that own most all of the um, clinics in California, and this is a $3 billion a year business. The proposal that's been put forward, Prop 2023, 20, says that clinics must have at least one physician on site at all hours when patients are receiving treatment, offer the same level of treatment, whether it's paid for by the government or private insurers, and report more info, uh, information, I should say, about infection rates. Supporters say patients should have access to a physician when being treated. Proper reporting of infection rates would encourage improved quality of treatment, and strong protection should be provided to vulnerable patients when clinics close. Opponents say this proposition would not, should not be on the ballot. It is a fight between the clinics and the union that wants to organize them and has been presented to voters before. And the opponents also say dialysis clinics are already strictly regulated. And finally, missed one, and it would, Prop 23 would force community clinics to cut services and close, putting lives at risk. Proposition 24, change to consumer privacy laws. The question before you this November is shall an existing law from 2018 passed by the California legislature, the California Consumer Privacy Act, be amended to increase penalties on companies that fail to follow regulations to allow consumers more easily to opt in and out of sharing their data, to change the criteria for which, by which businesses need to comply, and to create a new enforcement arm that would cost about $10 million annual, annually. Um, as we all know, with increased technology, there is a concern that too much can be known about users. The Consumer Protection Act of 2018 brought protections. It affects businesses that make more than $25 million a year and make more than 50% of their annual revenue from selling personal data. Proposition 24 would change the following about the current law. It would raise the threshold from 50,000 to 100,000 individuals whose data are subject to the rules. Consumers could direct businesses not to use their personal data and it would raise the penalties and mandate immediate penalties for violators. And it would create a new California Privacy Protection Agency. Supporters say Prop 24 would prevent businesses from using or sharing sensitive data about your health, finances, race, or location. It establishes an agency to strengthen existing protections. And because it is a ballot initiative, it is less vulnerable to being watered down by legislators being pressured by lobbyists. Opponents say Prop 24 puts the burden on consumers to opt out of intrusive data collection and that people without money to spend cannot pay for loyalty programs and loyalty programs and can expect worse connections, slower downloads, and more pop-up ads. Prop 24 would also continue to allow employers to keep gathering data about things like employees, pregnancies, religion, or political activism. And finally, we come to Prop 25. Yes or no on getting rid of cash bail. This is a rep referendum on a law that replaced money, the money bail system with a system based on public safety and flight risk. A yes vote, vote approves that law that was passed in the legislature, and a no vote rejects the law replacing money bail 
with a system based on public safety and flight risk. I say all that because sometimes I get confused on those referendums and I'm figuring I'm not the only one. The question, should the law enacted by the California legislature, SB 10 to be exact, to replace current cash bill, the current cash bill system be approved? In 2018, the person's prior record and the likelihood of the person appearing in court for the trial. In some instances, people are released on their promise to appear at trial. In others, they have to put up a financial guarantee, bail. Some use their own personal ads, assets as a financial guarantee to be returned when they show up for trial or a person can arrange for a bail insurance policy to provide the financial guarantee, that financial guarantee. Bail insurance companies charge non-refundable fees to provide these financial guarantees. Should be noted, the bail bond industry bankrolled a petition drive to get this issue on the ballot. The proposal, Prop 25 would allow SB 10 to go into effect it would eliminate the cash bail system. It would, it would replace the cash bail system with risk assessment to determine whether a detainee should be released. Those deemed to be of medium risk would be detained or released. High risk suspects could argue their case to a judge. Many people suspected of misdemeanors could be released. Supporters say the current system favors rich defendants who can easily make bail and keeps poor defendants and people of color in jail. People who are eventually found not guilty or not even charged may be stuck with large debts to pay off for the bail or for, and or for the fees. Opponents say the intentions of SB 10 are good, but its provisions may effectively result in more people being jailed than are currently. They also say that Prop 25 would cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars a year, overturning, overturning courts and creating a new bureaucracy. And that is the end of the propositions that are on your ballot for this coming November. Um, I would urge you to review the Legal Women Voters Pros and Cons Guides, as you can tell from what we've been speaking about. There's a lot of ins and outs to all these measures, and some of them can be confusing, and it's like, what is going on? I know I find that uh, even, having even having read some of them, so I encourage you, especially if you're a policy wonk, to, to take a minute and go, and go take a look at the uh, pros and cons guides on these uh, ballot measures. There's some key dates you need to remember for our November election. It's November 3rd not 11th, like I heard a senator say the other day. The start of early voting, it started. It started October 5th. It's at Outdoor City Hall near Bill Graham Auditorium. It, they're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. The last day to register to vote is October 19th. So please keep that in mind. Uh, we're talking Monday. Yeah, Monday. Um, Weekend voting and ballot drop-off drop at City Hall or slash Bill Graham Auditorium um, begin are on October 17th and 18th, the 24th and 25th, and October 31st and November 1st from 10 to 4, and on November 3rd from 7 in the morning till 8 p.m. Your vote by mail ballot must be postmarked postmarked by November 3rd. If you don't feel you can get it in the mail and postmarked by November 3rd, please take advantage of the drop-off at Bill Graham. And don't forget, follow all the steps, seal, sign, and date it. Okay? And if you want more information or to register, please contact the League of Women Voters.
in San Francisco. We ask you to stay contacted. Again, visit our ProCon resources. You can see the links there. Uh, we've got uh, virtual advisors. If you have questions on the ballot measures that are available at some times during the day, go on our website at LWBSF dot org and you can get all that information. You can email us if you wish with questions at voter services at lwvsf.org. And if you want to vote with the league, then please go to our website, lwvsf.org slash ballot recommendations, or for statewide ballots, lwvc.org slash vote slash election slash ballot rec hyphen recommendations. Thank you. And our the question. Yes, hi. Um, I'll read some of the questions that um, we weren't able to answer in the Q and A, and perhaps Danielle and Maxine can can fill us in. Hopefully, um, right. <laughs> Yes, so um, the first question is about Prop 18. What happens if Prop 18 passes and San Francisco Prop G does not, or vice versa, does either have legal primacy? So this is the one about um, 16 and 17 year olds voting. Uh, so in that case, 17 year olds, so if, say if Prop, if, if Prop 18 passed, but then Prop G did not pass in San Francisco, we would it would be the state law that would be prevailing so 17 year olds would be able to vote in primaries and in general elections in san francisco but 16 year olds would not be able to vote in local elections okay and then prop 22 does keeping drivers as independent contractors mean that corporations do not have to pay employer taxes and other benefits also would prop 22 make these services more expensive Maxine, do you um, want to take that? Prop 22, it would reclassify uh, those individuals who drive um, as independent contractors. And no, they would not have to pay any employee benefits for those individuals. They would be treated um, as if you were an independent contractor at a, at a company and you came in, you perform your service, and they pay you a certain amount of money, and then that, that would be it. And what was the second part of the question? Uh, would, if Prop 22 passes, would it make these services more expensive? Um, the services would be based on whatever the companies decided they wanted to charge. Uh, this Prop 22 only affects the drivers who work for those companies as uh, independent contractors or as employees. Okay, the next question is about Prop 14, the stem cell one. Uh, what happens to scientists currently funded by CIRM grants if Prop 14 doesn't pass? And what will happen to CIRM if Prop 14 doesn't pass? So I can't answer the second part of that. Actually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Like what happens to CIRM if the prop doesn't pass? Um, there, it, and that's not really outlined. Uh, at least in the, the reading that I've done. Um, if you are currently funded by a CIRM grant and Prop 14 doesn't pass, so if you were already awarded that grant, it's been allocated to you. So you would continue to get paid. You would not though be able to come back to CIRM. So uh, it's common in like government contracting for there to be say like phase one, phase two type grants. If say you got a phase one grant and that money would be set aside for you, but it there may not necessarily be phase two money set aside for you. Um, if you came back and went, we're hoping that CIRM was gonna actually be able to fund you. Uh, the second one though, I have to do a little bit of research on that because I'm not sure if CIRM continues to be around, like if they have enough budget to continue to cover their administrative expenses, um, or if somehow they, they go away if we don't actually do this ballot proposition. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to that one, but I just, I don't off the top of my head. Okay, um, Prop 15, uh, uh, someone says, I thought that Prop 15 applied to small businesses as well as private residences. Why would small businesses be opposing it? 
So Prop 15, there is some applicability to small businesses. Um, pull up my notes on that one real quick. Give me one second. And you are welcome to jump in, Maxine, if you have an answer on something. I'm not, um, let's see. Uh, so it does, it does apply to small businesses, but it depends on what you classify a small business. Uh, so it does exempt small businesses with fewer than 50 employees uh, and commercial properties that are worth $300 million or less. So that is the small business carve out. If you have over 50 employees, Um, on a lot again about prop 15 um, is it true that uh, apartment buildings would be exempt even if they're worth more than three million um, yes yeah I think that is true yeah the apartment buildings would be exempt prop this only speaks to commercial and industrial property finally prop 20 if Prop 20 is to reclassify these crimes as violent, what are they cur currently classified as? And is it common for questions like this to be posed to voters? Um, there was, again, there was, has been a push in California to decriminalize some crimes that were um, listed as felonies. Um, down to misdemeanors and um, to change the way we did sentencing in the state of California. Um, so this would pretty much roll the ball backwards to reclassify those crimes as, um, as felonies and keep people in jail a lot longer. Could you give me the second half of the question? I was thinking so hard on the first. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, is it common for questions like this to be posed to the voters? Oh, God. Anyone, <laughs> um, the league has thought about this for many years, and the, the fact of the matter is, here in California, uh, if you have a deep enough purse or a, a, a passionate issue, you can get ballot measures on the mail, on the ballot, and also I'm sure you've all seen, and we encourage everyone, when someone walks up to you with several clipboards worth of ballot measures that you just basically, if you want to glance over and find, if you see one that looks like it speaks to you, then just indicate to that person, I need to find out more about what this really says or what this really is going to do before I sign it. But people have been pretty much gotten into the habit of just signing them when these when people are out collecting um signatures for ballot measures so yeah then this is what we get on the ballot and i will add a little bit to that like we have we've had at least in 2011 and 2014 and i think 2016 or 2017 i can't remember there have been several ballot measures around this type of thing right like where we're trying to we're trying to they've all been an effort to essentially figure out how to empty prisons right how do we keep people in prison for less time incarcerate less people be more fair in the way that we incarcerate people so we do get ballot measures like this periodically i'd say the one thing that's different between I think it's like, it's like AB 109 prop 47 and prop 57 is this one is looking to to leave it a little bit more flexible, right? It has some potential to to maybe up the number of people who are in prison, right? If you if you listen to the the you know the opponent side of this. Um, so there is a lot of things like this that end up on the ballot. And I think Maxine's hundred percent right. It's you know if you can get enough signatures and you can get enough people out on the street, that's how you get stuff on the ballot in, in California. But we have had other things that have been like this. All of them have been intended to re, re, kind of reduce the state's prison inmate population um, prior to this one. So this one is the one that there's not, it, 
that's not the intention necessarily of this bill. It's, it's, it is more the reclassification of some of these crimes to make them more serious or to allow some flexibility in whether they're charged as misdemeanors or felonies. Um, okay, it looks like we've answered all the questions that came in through Q&A. Um, so I guess there's time for another question if anyone has an urgent one. Um, or we can wrap up. I'm happy to give people, you know, time to ask another question or give them five minutes of their day back as well. <laughs> we will be recording this just so everybody knows or it was, was recorded. So if you need to go back and review it, um, you're going to be sent a link essentially as a follow up. Um, and then I did have that one second part of the question, I think on Prop 17. So I'll try to answer that in the follow-up email as well. Um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, within probably the next you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, and if you have follow-up questions, the local San Francisco League does do one-on-one um, -on -one sessions, uh, Wednesdays from six to seven, and Saturdays from 12.30 to 1.30, uh, where you can call in and ask about particular ballot propositions, or I've had a couple of people call in and just fill out their ballot while they're on the phone with me, um, and try to kind of get their questions answered uh, one at a time. So that is a virtual session, and you can sign up for one of those at L wvsf.org slash ask, A-S-K. Oh, we have some more questions. <laughs> yeah, um, someone's asking, could you say more about Prop 24? Prop 24. 24, which one is that one? Those are the consumer privacy laws. Um, oh, God. That one was um, very interesting. As you can see, um, the California legislature just passed um, the Consumer Privacy Act in 2018. And uh, it just started going into effect this year? Yeah, I it believe. was just this year, yep. This year it started going into effect. And um, this was, from the information that I've gotten, this was put forth as something that would strengthen the privacy rules for um, for children, as far as uh, them being on the internet and uh, increasing fines or making the fines effective immediately if uh, those internet privacy rules are violated. There were a lot of pages to this ballot measure, um, but Basically, what it does is it establishes some, again, establishes um, some of the things that companies need to do uh, as far as using and sharing sensitive data, but it also relaxes some of the things that they were required to do um, under the original law, such as under the original law, everybody was opted out until you opted in. And this says you, you have to opt out and opt in individually across uh, platforms. So uh, that's one change that the opponents say about it. Um, as far as if you have a specific question about it, if you could let us know what that specific question is about Prop 24, because this very technologically written and so I'm going to have to go out, go back and do some research with people I know who have read this and understand what is going on on this, and then we can get back to you with an answer. So for the person, the um, audience member who has a question on Prop 24, I'm not trying to blow you off, but I don't want to give you bad information either. So if you could just let us know exactly what part of it you want to know about then uh, we can get the information and get it back to you. Any other questions? Um, someone asks about Prop 15. What about mixed property, like four apartments on top and a store at street level? <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I assume that the property, if it's multi-zoned, it could be assessed separately. Um, but I actually don't know the answer to that. I would have to look, I'd have to do a little bit of research uh, to see 
like actually read the legal text to see if it does exclude. Um, I know residential properties are excluded, but I don't know if mixed use properties are excluded. Okay, and also um, as far as Prop 17 goes, are parolees not allowed to vote at the moment? Parolees are not allowed to vote at the moment. If you are on probation, you can vote. If you're on parole, you cannot. And earlier someone had asked, I answered it in the Q&A, um, but uh, someone had asked, what's the difference between parole and probation? Uh, I mean, parole is essentially something that happens when you get released slightly early from your sentence or you're designated as someone who they, you're eligible for parole. Probation it can be a sentence in and of itself, right? You can be placed on probation as your sentence. Oh, I just lost Michelle. I lost her audio. I, oh, she muted I herself. Muted myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a good place to find out who is paying for or against the state ballot measures? Um, I would say that like Voters Edge has some of that information. I, me personally, this is uh, this is not a league recommendation. I'll be clear, but I use a site called Ballotopedia.org. Um, it's B A L L O T. P E D I A dot org. Um, and they tend to really tell you who's paying, who's for it, who's against it, and how much money has been spent on it by each of the different sides. And I find that very useful in trying to understand kind of who benefits from this particular law being passed. Right. And uh, Voters Edge is also has a lot of information along those lines too, especially about the top five uh, funders yep. on different measures. So, very but, good places to look. Yeah, there are definitely there are there are sites that really focus on who's spending the money and who's who's backing this. Yeah. Are we good? I think we're good. Are we good? Then I should say goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having us. We appreciate <laughs> it. And thank, you. Yeah, yeah. and thank you for everybody who hung out with us till the end. We really appreciate that. I love seeing people who actually want to be informed about their vote. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.